Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Last week on this program, we began what turned out to be a uh, very uh, vigorous and spirited discussion about Dinesh D'Souza's controversial new book entitled The End of Racism. Uh, today, we will resume that discussion to give you a flavor of why it is controversial. Let me read one quote from page 22 of the book. Dinesh D'Souza writes this, virtually all the contemporary liberal assumptions about the origin of racism, its historical significance, its contemporary effects, and what to do about it are wrong. Joining us to sort through that argument are in the hot seat, the author of the book, Dinesh D'Souza, research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Glenn Lowry, a university professor at Boston University and author of One by One from the Inside Out, Essays and Reviews on Race and Responsibility in America. Christopher Edley, professor of law at Harvard University and former head of President Clinton's Task Force on Affirmative Action. And Michael Cromarty of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. The topic before this house, The End of Racism, part two, this week on Think Tank. We are back again with the uh, distinguished panel that we had assembled uh, last week about uh, dealing with Dinesh D'Souza's new book, uh, The End of Racism, th that uh, viewers who saw that program will remember that it uh, ended with what is called in the business a vigorous discussion, and we have decided to continue it. Dinesh, when we get to remedies of, 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 um, in your book, you are basically saying that all race-based government policies should be eliminated, including affirmative action. Uh, this would be uh, help create a healthy multiracial society. Uh, you say that private individuals, however, uh, should be free to discriminate, and in fact, you say there are times when racial discrimination can be rational. Explain that. Well, the classic example of rational discrimination is the dilemma of the cab driver uh, who is hesitant or reluctant to pick up a young black male, particularly at night. Uh, the cab driver doesn't know his uh, clients personally, uh, and young black males unfortunately commit a disproportionately high rate of crimes, particularly violent crimes in this country. So the cab driver's dilemma uh, is that he doesn't necessarily have to be a racist in order to discriminate. In fact, black cab drivers, Middle Eastern cab drivers, Pakistani cab drivers act no differently from white cab drivers. And the, the tragedy of this uh, is that if, if Christopher Edley wasn't dressed in, this, in a beautiful suit with a lovely tie, uh, uh, the cab driver doesn't know. Uh, and so he's going to make a group judgment. Now we can say that that's wrong, a, 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 but it a, is. As an Indian from the subcontinent of India, do you ever experience that sort of racism? I'm constantly, I, well, let me say two things. First, I think that while many people may think, may not like Hispanics or Asians regarding us to be lazy or clannish or whatever, it's the suspicion of black inferiority that's the heart of racism. And so I would not claim to have, have gone through the same experience. On the other hand, sure, I run into people all the time who expect elephants to be walking on the street in India. These are misperceptions that, that those of us who are immigrants are, run into all the time. Uh, but, you know, let me say, I would not have devoted, you know, years of my life to thinking about the subject if it's something on which I wanted to counsel malign neglect or indifference. It's something I care about. I want to, to, to argue for a set of rules in which people of different backgrounds can get along. And, and, and your set of rules is, again, just to a put it briefly, is, is to get the government out of race-based and, and let the market. It's what I call separation of race and state. Look, uh, we need to get the government out of the race business, and what we need to do is pay attention to our real problems. Our real problem is this, that, that immigrants are coming to this country, including black uh, immigrants, including Caribbean immigrants, and they are leapfrogging, they're going ahead of African Americans, and they are succeeding. They are claiming their share of the American dream, leaving blacks behind. Blacks are not competitive with other groups in American society today in measures of academic achievement, economic performance. This is the heart of the problem that we need to address. All right. Christopher Edley, you just devoted a number of months of your life to uh, helping the president uh, uh, prepare this uh, vast study of affirmative action, uh, which deals with the problem that uh, Dinesh is talking about. How do you come out on, on, on this idea of, of the government uh, ought to get out of the business of race? I, I, I think it, it's both bizarre and frightening and ahistorical. 
Uh, it, 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 I mean, let's go, but other than that, <laughs> I think it's, in, it's interesting. It's a, so the, uh, <coughs> look, the issue, the, 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 issue to me, the issue to me is not whether uh, we ought to label the cab driver's behavior as racist or not. Right? Uh, there is a prejudgment in the cab driver's decision to, to, uh, to, to pass up the, uh, the, uh, the young black male. There is a prejudgment, and we have to make a decision as a society as whether that kind of prejudgment is one that we want to permit or one that we want to lean against as best we can. And, and what do you think the, the answer is? I think we must lean against that kind of judgment, just, but, as, we but, but judgment, if, just as we must lean against a prejudgment made by an employer but, about, to whom, about whom to hire but, but, or whom but, to but promote. But wait a minute. But, but if you were a black cab driver and, and, and you left a wife and three kids at home and she said, honey, be careful today, or be careful, you know, I always worry about you. It's a dangerous job, taxi cab driver, uh, taxi cab driving. And, and w w would you resist picking up uh, two young black teenage males at night knowing what you know about the, the disproportionate crime rates? It, 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 it's, look, it, it, I'm not denying that it is a tough question. It is a real uh, tough question. We have done a lot of, we've done a lot of things to try to, uh, to, try to address the problem. Uh, you know, you go in a lot of big cities and they have uh, plastic partitions right. to try to provide protection. Uh, 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 you have lock boxes in cabs. There are lots of... Yeah, no, I see. Th so I, what I want to draw is a distinction between whether or not we label the behavior of that cab driver or, to, to make the point more concrete, the behavior of an employer who may not be interested in hiring a young black male because of a prejudgment that, uh, that, uh, that, that he will not be uh, a good worker, or that he will be disruptive, or something of that sort. Uh, uh, is that behavior that we want to say is perfectly okay? Uh, is that behavior that we somehow want to try to proscribe legally, that we want government to get involved uh, in, trying to, uh, in trying to prohibit it, in trying to punish it? What I'm saying is that if there's going to be any hope, any hope of closing the opportunity gap, if there's going to be any hope of trying to take the people who are in the underclass and give them their fair share of America's opportunities, then we cannot allow those opportunities to be depressed by rampant, a rampant set, of, a pervasive set of prejudgments, of prejudices, whether or not you label them racist. I think, actually, the cab driver case is not hard. I think it's easy. I think the cab driver has to preserve his life. And in any case, you can't force him not to do it. Uh, the employment case for rational discrimination is much harder. Now, I have the attitude that black men don't want to work, and so perhaps I don't hire them in favor of Hispanic men or Asian men or whatever. The bank lending case is harder still. I think this neighborhood may go down because the racial composition is such and such a thing. It's in distinguishing among these cases, in deciding as a society to what extent we can, um, you know, uh, countenance a certain amount of rational discrimination and to what extent we must stand for something else. That's where all the work has to be done. Unfortunately, this work isn't done in Dinesh's book, but that's not to his discredit because it's really hard. He's really just reporting in this discussion of rational discrimination about stuff that you know, many people from uh, Tom Soule to Sandy Jenks and others uh, have worked out over the years. How do we get further? That's what needs to be done. It's not done in this book. Dinesh argues in his <laughs> book and on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal that it's time to um, reconfigure the Civil Rights Act of 1964 so that it applies to government, which would eliminate affirmative action and racial preferences enforced by government, but that it would not apply to private behavior, which would permit, for example, um, motel and restaurant owners not to serve blacks legally, which would permit employers to refuse to hire blacks simply because they didn't feel like doing it and so on. Dinesh, I own a diner in Louisville. Uh, the four of you come in and I say, uh, Chris and Glenn, I'm not going to serve you. Uh, that's okay? I mean, I, I recall well, when, I, when I was in the military in, in Texas a long time ago, that, exactly that situation happened to me. We went there as an integrated group and I said, I can't serve these. See, the line, uh, there's uh, in a liberal society, in a free society, we have to draw a line between the, pro the public and the private domain. The example you're giving me, the hotel, the motel, the diner, is a tough one because it falls in the middle of that line, in the gray area. In other words, 
is a hotel, a motel, or a diner, at some level a public institution because it's putting up a sign and serving the public? This issue has been addressed by courts for years. Let's take a simple case. No, not, me, not after me, the 1964 the Civil Rights Act. That was the heart of the debate. No, the heart fair of enough. The and, and it was addressed by the courts, and they said it, that's quasi-public, and you may not that's say right. you can't come in. Right, and I'm not quarreling between the public-private distinction, but I'm saying right now it is the case that private discrimination that doesn't trespass on that fuzzy line is also illegal. And I'm saying that, that, that those forms of private discrimination... For example, for, for, for example, for example, what? I mean, well, there's, right, right, the, the right, title, title VII, the Civil Rights Act, does not affect who you invite to your dinner parties. I, I, you're right. I, the point I'm making is, is, is a little bit nuanced, so don't, let, me, let me make it first, Please, then, then yeah, jump right. on me. Um, <laughs> yes, the sociologist Christopher Jenks gives the example of, of baseball teams. Imagine the case of baseball teams. Uh, and he says that if every baseball team in America discriminated against blacks, that we won't hire any blacks, the burden of this would fall most heavily on blacks. They wouldn't be able to get into professional baseball. Uh, maybe the games would be a little uh, weaker in quality. Maybe fans would, would, would suffer a bit, but blacks would suffer the most. On the other hand, now imagine if three baseball teams said, we don't want blacks. Who would suffer the most? Blacks? No, because the black players could go to other teams. It would be those three baseball teams that would suffer in games, in revenue, in losses, in angry fans, and so on. My point is that in a free society where the government isn't coercively supporting racism, there is automatic competitive pressure against discrimination. Michael, uh, Michael Crowe, hold, 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 hold on, Glenn, just what, uh, sophomore. Uh, my, Michael, it's, uh, it's hold, hold on, Michael Crowe. What's wrong with it? Wait well, well, I'll, hold I'll on, Michael, Michael Crowe, uh, you have defended uh, Dinesh's book. He is now uh, under serious attack, I, I mean, about this 1964 Civil ugly. Rights Act. Uh, it's, it's, do, do you think he's going over the line on, on, on this aspect of it? I, on this point, I do, yes. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you're a black family riding through Selma, Alabama, or somewhere in the South, you ought to be able to stay in any hotel you want I to. I agree. And I, but if you remove the, uh, the statutes to say that it's wrong to do that, then I, I, I don't think there's going to be any pressure on a manager of a hotel or of a restaurant to not let you eat there or sleep there. Dinesh, I, I know that you agree, but do you think, do, do you agree so strongly that it ought to be a matter of law? I, I agree that, the, I, to me, the, ho the, the restaurant, the hotel, these are quasi-public institutions, and the law regards them as such, and I'm not contesting that. I'm concerned more, with, let me put a diff different case to you and to Glenn. Uh, go down to Washington, D.C., to a Korean store. Look in the back. You see 15 other Koreans. Is the Korean hiring other people who are like him? Yes. Right? Is he, is he discriminating? Yes. Should that be illegal? Now, if we decided in our society we want outlaw discrimination, no discrimination is permitted either in favor of blacks or against blacks, then you'd have to go break down that Korean store and say, why are you hiring other Koreans? Now, I know as someone who has looked at history that historically ethnic groups in this country have advanced by helping their own guys. That this is true of the Jews, it's true of the Italians, it's true of the Irish. And I don't want to destroy those ladders of, 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 of good ethnocentrism, of people trying to pull up other people who are like them, whom, with whom they share cultural affinities. Uh, this is a healthy trend in American society, so, and in a free, a free society, it, 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 it would not regulate it. Is that now illegal for, for, for a Korean shop owner to hire 15 Koreans and no one else? Well, you said 15. Actually, it, it is number. illegal. The right, question is, is, what's the size of the business? When there's, there's, there is, is a the threshold. What's the threshold? I think, it's, 15, I think it's 15 employees. 15. But, 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 uh, but no, so in, in fact, words, it is a, illegal. A truly small business uh, can hire uh, all Koreans. Right. But once so, you get to I mean, a certain I, I, threshold, you start saying... Right. The notion in the legislative history was if, if it's a family business. This is you know, the Mrs. really a family kind of thing. Exactly. Mom and pop. Mom and pop. But once you start getting into something that begins to really be commerce, then, uh, then it bites. I think, I think uh, there, there may be a bit of a legal misunderstanding here. The, the, uh, the statute that Dinesh talks about repealing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is precisely the statute that, that in the public accommodations provisions uh, opens up the hotels and the motels and the restaurants uh, and uh, in the employment title that opens up these employment opportunities. Uh, the thing that uh, their private behavior, the, who's at your dinner party, who's in your church, those are not regulated by, by, uh, by the civil rights statutes. Uh, when Dinesh says what law ought to worry about is how governments behave, well, that's done by the Constitution itself through the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, so the issue, it seems to me, is what kinds of prejudices, what kinds of prejudices are we willing as a society to tolerate 
in drawing this distinction between private behavior that for libertarian uh, uh, motivations are otherwise private behavior that we will leave unregulated and other kinds of behavior, private or commercial, that we say, look, sorry, our vision of America requires a more inclusive attitude uh, than the one that you, with your narrow prejudices, might be comfortable with. See, this is the, right. the central flaw here, because the civil rights movement for the last generation has been based on the assumption that racism is the theory and discrimination is the practice. And that's why things like prejudices are bad, because they are presumed to spring out of the racist impulse. Now, if I am an Indian setting up a, a cab company, and I want to hire 25 Indians, uh, or 100 Indians for that matter, um, there, are, there are economic uh, and moral reasons to permit me to do this. There are Indians who come to this country who don't speak English, who don't have access to credit, who are strangers in a new land, uh, and, and entrepreneurship is a very good way to integrate them into the economy. On the other hand, this is not because I'm prejudiced against anybody, I am prejudiced in favor of Indians. This should not be illegal in a free society. But that is, that, that, that it seems to me is the difficulty. When, the difficulty uh, at, at is... What, no, at, at, at what point does uh, the law firm, that, uh, look, they're not prejudiced against anybody, they're just prejudiced in favor of people just like them. I, I think Dinesh is wrong on the substance, and we're obviously not going to resolve it here. But let me just observe that um, this argument is ahistorical, and... A, um, a, a, to tell it, us uh, Well, to, just for the reason that you just said. You just, you can remember driving through the South, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there were a set of events that dealt with that. One of them was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Any good justice will tell you, uh, as a matter of jurisprudence, that you wouldn't want to repeal a precedent without any good reason. There's no reason to do it. Uh, to, 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 do to make the world safe for Indian taxi companies? No, the world That's is not a serious argument, and I'm not finished. When, <laughs> when, when people said, Be sensitive, Glenn. When yeah, people right. said <laughs> conservatives were trying to turn back the clock because they disagreed with liberals about civil rights, I stood up and said, you're wrong, they've got arguments, I think they're right about most of their arguments. Now we've got conservatives unabashedly saying, hell yeah, I want to turn back the clock, it's a new generation, you people are living in the past. This is a, um, this is not a ten year. Even this, this is, this is a, a willful disattention to a central theme in modern American history. This would be not just mischievous, this would be more than mischievous, this would be political reaction of a very high order, and I doubt that you can find two or three serious Republican politicians who have to get elected and who have to govern a multiracial country who will truck with this kind of nonsense. Even, uh, Phil, Graham says, even Phil Graham says that he favors vigorous enforcement of the civil rights statutes. You may want to trim a little bit on the, well, uh, you may want to trim substantially on some of the interpretations, but the statute that's on the book he favors. I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid this is bluster. The, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to uh, propose political solutions. My book is an intellectual book, a scholarly book. It's a way of trying to think through first principles. Uh, when I mean, when I talk about the end of racism, I ask, what is our destination? Where do we want to go? Uh, and, and the arguments are aimed at trying to point us that way. Now, when I, when I hear these arguments about history and so on, um, I'm well aware of history, but I, I'm also uh, reminded of the, of the passage in the Bible about Moses leading um, the Israelites to the Promised Land, but Moses couldn't get them there. Why? Because he was too committed to old struggles. And that's the problem here. The problem here is, I'm sure if you asked Alexander Solzhenitsyn, what's the most serious problem facing Russia? He would say, the return of the Bolsheviks. And you, here we have two people pro proclaiming the return of the Bolsheviks. I'm simply saying I have more faith in young people. I have more faith in the new generation that can get beyond the pathologies of race that have poisoned earlier generations and made everybody go around uh, po policing words and saying, oh, we are, we are dependent on the government, but not Sambo. dependent but, but, but on the government. The Sambos of today. Tell no, me, who, I, who, who are the Sambos uh, of today? Look, I, I was talking, I am, I, you are citing a passage which deals with historical scholarship on black culture. What, I, what I'm there telling were, you is that uh, rapacious uh, uh, Jewish money lenders would be out of bounds in contemporary America and contemporary Europe for good reason. I mean, as, and a, Sambos, as, a as a phrase. As a as phrase. A phrase. And yeah. Sambos and sullen field hands and mammies is out of bounds. And if you don't know it, it's not because I'm hysterical. It's because you're indifferent or insensitive to no. something that's important about contemporary American life. I'm not talking about contemporary American life. You are describing a historical argument about the evolution of black culture. There's no question that under slavery, for example, uh, the person who was admired under slavery was the runaway, the rebel, the so-called bad Negro, because he was, after all, not allowing his spirit to be crushed by oppression. And all I was trying to do in that passage was to explain how a prototype, an archetype, that was admired under slavery, admired under segregation, the person who said no, who refused to succumb to the system, whereas the person who played by the rules was an Uncle Tom. But I'm saying the world has changed now, and today, if you want to be an outlaw, a bad Negro, a rebel, 
you're going to end up in the hospital, in the morgue, in prison. And the people who are attacked as Uncle Toms, and, and Glenn, you, you, know, you know that there are people who, who are willing to use these phrases very easily. Many of, of those who are attacked as Uncle Toms are defending civilizational values, including, I will say, Glenn Lowry. Okay, now, hold on. I, I, I want to I wanna try something out here. We've seen, uh, to say the least, what the disagreements are here. Uh, this super central point of Dinesh's book is to, to paraphrase the Clinton 1992 thing, it's the economy stupid. He's saying it's the culture stupid. That's what he's saying. My recollection of your writings is, if you strip away all the other stuff, Glenn, you do not disagree with that. Absolutely not. More than that. More than that, I agree with what is a corollary of Dinesh's argument. I don't think he makes it explicit, which is that the fact that civil rights leadership among African Americans since King has not attended to this problem, mm -hmm. has hurt the group politically, has undercut our ability to make credible arguments, yeah. has made it possible for a person like me, who has been ostracized and who has spent over a decade making many of the arguments that Dinesh wants to make, to appear to be, you know, um, oh, just one of those uh, complainers when I object, I think rightly, to, uh, to his excesses and his error. So that uh, th 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 we have a problem here. We have a problem with race, and the problem has been sown to some degree, in my judgment, by the intellectual bankruptcy of the civil rights movement. My intention in my writing is to try to work us out of the problem. I don't think Dinesh is helpful there, but I could be wrong. I mean, we, uh, we agree on this, and I think Dinesh agrees with this also, but he can speak for himself, and that is that racism is still a problem in American society. I think where we disagree is that some of these problems are really in the moral cultural arena, and the reason we have culture wars in our society today is because these different value systems are, are about certain behavioral patterns are being contested. And I think that there are not many political and legal and legislative solutions to getting fathers to go back to homes and, having, and, and to prevent children from having babies. There are just not a lot of legal answers to that, and I, I think that then, therefore, the only reason there's hope is that we do need, as Gertrude Himmelfarb, the historian, has said, some kind of religious awakening to rejuvenate our communities, both black and white. May I add one more, one more point, Ben? Uh, there's more to the disagreement with Dinesh, I think, than, uh, than something about tone or something about emphasis. What is striking to me is the gap in perceptions that it evidences uh, between uh, the, at least the African-American perception of what America is like today and the perceptions of, of, of many others. Is prejudice, or racism if you want to call it that, uh, something which is being uh, ever so uh, tenuously repressed, uh, constantly ready to rear its ugly head, reassert itself? Or indeed, is it genuinely a thing of the past? My fear, when I see swastikas in Harvard Square, uh, when I see Mark Furman, when I see the lawsuit against Denny's Restaurant, is that too many whites, too many people in the majority culture, dismiss episodes like that as aberrant. Whereas many people in the African American community, many minorities, perceive that that's, those are just the tip of the iceberg. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. And those behaviors, which some would dismiss as aberrant, are in the first instance far more pervasive than may be readily detected, but secondly, ready to mushroom, ready to explode in significance. That is a, that is a tremendous gap I, in perceptions, I, and we I don't know how we bridge it. Mr. Michael. I take it that the central argument of this book is that it is a cultural problem, a cultural problem that's been addressed by, by these gentlemen here now, and I think it's a cultural problem that, in fact, is exacerbating the increase of racism in our society. In fact, because of these social pathologies, which are not just peculiar to black people, but to white young people, who I don't have as much confidence as, as Dinesh does about their enlightenment about these issues, uh, these uh, social behaviors and the fact that we have so many children without parents and so many children who don't even know what a father is are going to, in fact, uh, exacerbate and increase racial stereotyping and racial problems in society. And unless those behavioral patterns are curtailed, they won't ever go away totally, but curtailed, then I think we're going to have even more of a racial crisis in society. Okay. That's, the, mes the, that's the, the message of my book. We say it for well, us. Well, that, that, that if our problems are the product of genes, we can't do anything about them. If the problems are the result of racism, 
uh, fighting racism, I think, has run its course. There's nothing new we can do to fight racism that will address these cultural issues. So we should realize they've taken on a life of, it, of their own. And the end of racism is about not diverting our attention from that crisis and facing it squarely. Okay, thank you, Dinesh D'Souza, Glenn Lowry, Michael Cromarty, and Christopher Edley. And thank you. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 11507th Street Northwest, Suite 1050, Washington, D.C., 20036. We can be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com and do check out our new homepage on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.